Good morning, survivors, and welcome to the American Philosophical Society's Fall Symposium on Living with Climate Change, Perspectives from the Humanities and Beyond. I'm, I'm Bob Hauser, and I'm the Executive Officer of the Society. This week's conference tackles an issue that is at the forefront of many of our minds, and especially uh, this week, climate change. The purpose of this event is to look beyond the science that proves the existence of climate change and instead to consider how a changing climate is both currently and going to continue to affect people in all aspects of their lives. The goal is to think about climate change and its impact from different and perhaps unexpected perspectives. This conference is also inspired by the Society's current exhibition, Becoming Weatherwise, A History of Climate Science in America, which is currently open to the public Thursday through Sunday from now until the end of December. For those joining us in person, we hope you'll take an opportunity to visit this, the exhibition during today's lunch break, and for those who are interested, there will be a tour at 12.15. There's a map located inside your program, as well as ex on the exhibition flyers located where you entered at the registration desk. The proceedings from today's conversations are also being live streamed, and we invite those of you attending remotely to participate in the conversation on the Society's social media using the hashtag uh, number sign APS Climate Con 2022. That's APS Climate Con 2022. And by submitting your questions using BoxCast, we'll have time to at, for you to ask your questions at the end of each session. Now I have to tell you uh, what the effect of climate change has been on our, our proceedings. Um, we have had a combination of events which have prevented some folks from showing up, uh, notably associated with travel and climate change. Uh, and for that reason, our first presentation um, today is gonna to be somewhat different. Uh, it will be by uh, Baird Miller, who is the, uh, the head of digital uh, scholarship at the APS. And he's gonna be talking about the North Atlantic Climate History Project. Baird has been responsible for several notable um, digital projects at the APS. Um, our, our, uh, our uh, what should I say, database and interactive uh, uh, scheme, uh, which, which describes the, the, uh, the circumstances of incarceration at uh, the Eastern State Penitentiary in the mid 19th century, um, and uh, the digitization of the uh, um, the the various uh, logbooks that Benjamin Franklin and Deborah Franklin and friends uh, created, uh, both when he was both through his shop and when he was postmaster of Philadelphia. And now a very major, one of the two major projects now uh, called Revolutionary City, uh, which is, digit, which is uh, digitizing the holdings of, of, the, of the APS, of the Historic, Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and the Library Company of Pennsylvania to create a common, public, freely accessible portal uh, that will uh, provide access to all of the manuscripts that we have that pertain to the role of Philadelphia during the American Revolution. Um, but Bayard is going to be talking, as I said, about our another project, which is to digitize uh, a number of weather records uh, that were kept in early America. Um, I also want to make another introduction at this time, uh, although... Uh, uh, this person will not take the stage quite yet, and that is, uh, but she will, uh, she will introduce the later 
uh, presentations in this panel, and that is Claire Campbell. Dr. Campbell is professor of history at Bucknell University, where she teaches a wide range of courses on environmental history, including coastal, urban, and colonial histories. She's taught at universities across Canada and in Denmark, but having moved to Pennsylvania from Nova Scotia, she has a particular interest in the Northeast and the North Atlantic and teaching Americans about what would become Canada. Her current project, Cities by the Sea, examines the place of water in Atlantic Canada's, Canada's port cities over the long 19th century. Her research tends to sit at the intersection of environmental history and public humanities, how historic landscapes can teach us about environmental sustainability and well-being. But first, we're going to hear from Baird Miller. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. <laughs> like Bob said, I'm Baird Miller. I run the Center for Digital Scholarship here at the APS. Um, so as a last minute addition uh, to this early panel, I've been thinking about how our climate history project uh, sort of fits in with this morning's Imagine Futures panel. And uh, though it could be a stretch or perhaps sound a little silly, the weather records that uh, I'm going to introduce to you were collected by men who were concerned very much about the climate and its impact on the land as they imagined the future of this country. Uh, but first, uh, why do we create data sets here at the APS? Well, at the CDS, we have an open data initiative this is where we digitize materials like account books, and then we transcribe them, uh, and we release them as data sets. Uh, we do this because we think this gives uh, researchers unprecedented access to materials that would be really, really difficult to use in their native form. Uh, so after we release them as data sets, we build out digital projects to show people uh, what they can do and what's possible to do with this data. But what I'm here to talk about today is our most recent open data project, and one that I'm really excited about. It's based around our, uh, our collection of historic weather diaries. The APS has a decent amount of weather accounts held within its collections. Uh, and so what we'd like to do is to get this valuable information off the page and into a form that will be far easier for researchers to consult. The uh, initial phase of the project focused on James Madison's weather diaries, as we see up here. Uh, Madison was a natural starting place for the project. Uh, not only was he an APS member, but he's also inspired by his close friend, Thomas Jefferson. So why did uh, Madison record the weather? Well, to boil it down, he was sort of inspired by a rivalry between these two men up here. Uh, while Jefferson's interest in recording the climate was certainly linked to plantation farming, he was also motivated by national pride. Uh, French nationalist Georges-Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon, no, I don't know, I always butcher that. Uh, <clears throat> so he sparked Jefferson's diary uh, when he described the climate of the American colonies as degenerative. Jefferson was not happy about this and set out to disprove this theory by building a small army of citizen scientists, including Madison. Uh, Madison learned Jefferson's method and recorded daily weather conditions at his plantation in uh, Montpelier in 1780, from 1784 to 1801. A side note that I, I believe, and I haven't looked down the record, but Madison was elected to the society because of his work with Jefferson and the weather records, correct? Yeah. Um, so Madison collected uh, temperature readings, uh, plus notations of weather conditions and meteorological events and data recorded from barometers, rain gauges, uh, wind speed and direction instruments, instrument, instruments and hygrometers. Uh, There's also seasonal and phenom phenological information, such as uh, dates of spring arrival of migratory birds or blossoming of plants and trees, data points that serve as markers of uh, climatic and ecological change. These are actually quite enjoyable to read, uh, and the author seems uh, intentionally poetic at times. Uh, I really enjoy when he remarks on food at the table, as seen in these experts here, uh, excerpts here, uh, peaches at table, uh, some sort of peas uh, first at table. Uh, and I always thought that uh, this is just what he write. You know, this is my dinner, my dinner diary. But then I realized, oh yeah, right, this is how he marks the growing season and how they can compare it for years to come. So, uh, the, in the summer of 2020, uh, we had two fellows working with us, Molly Nebbiolo and Joe McCook, and they worked tirelessly to transcribe, uh, digitize, uh, the recently digitized diaries and completed the transcription in pretty much record time. Uh, the next step, uh, as you can see here, here's the, uh, Madison books on the right, and then here is the newly created data set that they created over the thing. 
So the next step uh, with any of these digitization open data projects is to do some preliminary research and see what kind of visualizations we can produce. Uh, to this end, our fellows dove into the data and extracted two uh, main stories. The first examines the 1791 drought at uh, Montpellier. I always said wrong too. And uses it to discuss the impact of the weather extreme that weather extremes have on agriculture and the impact climate change has on it today. Uh, the second used Madison's plantations. Uh, oh, that's this one. Yeah. So here you go. These are uh, the visualizations that were created by Joe McCook, and this is exactly what they're what they're doing. Um, he also used this as a way to um, sort of uh, look at the way, uh, the impact that uh, climate had on the enslaved populations that worked on the plantation. The, uh, the second, uh, used, Molly's used Madison's plantations as a way to analyze the transatlantic seed trade, and it goes on to discuss the diverse makeup of Madison's gardens. These are just two of the many stories that this data has to tell, so I encourage you all to take a look at the site and, and sort of learn more. So, uh, we were doing this work while others were out there uh, doing the exact same thing. Uh, we found partners, uh, Jim McClure at Princeton Thomas Jefferson Papers, who was already working with the Center for Digital Editing at UVA to create a, a Thomas Jefferson weather record site. So Jim and I got together and thought that we should join forces and sort of come up with an idea for a bigger project. So uh, this bigger project is to create a free access digital resources from significant, these significant but previously underutilized sets of records of weather, climate, and seasonal change in the period of the early American Republic. So basically our common goal is to uh, make the material available online, not just transcribe data sets, but as layered digital humanities resources uh, equipped with interactive tools to let users query the records in interesting and informative ways. Uh, the projects uh, are sort of employing uh, similar technological solutions, and we share that objective of connecting the, our resources to enable exploration and utilization of the combined data sets. Essentially, we're trying to create one massive data set of early American weather records. So, we were uh, recently awarded a, an NEH Digital Humanities Advancement Grant to figure out how best to go about building out this massive data set of climate records. Um, so as climate change has become increasingly subject uh, to historical attention, uh, we found that long-running uh, sets of instrument-based uh, meteorological records by methodical observers uh, prior to the middle of the 19th century have been really in short supply. Basically, nothing uh, was really systematically collected before 1850. So we hope that this work will sort of unlock and make available to scholars, general users, students, uh, this wealth of information uh, that's essential not just for environmental history and climate history, but also economic history, social history, agricultural history, intellectual history, and even the history of science and technology. So here at the APS, uh, we are currently in the process of digitizing more weather records. And we have lots. There's a lot of Williams you'll see up there. Uh, this slide is chaotic looking, uh, and that's intentional, as it represents the chaotic nature of data projects such as these. Uh, we have all these different accounts, and all the authors kept their records using their own systems. Some conform to the Jefferson system, but many, many do not. And that's not to mention the books that we have, the diaries that we have are just narrative journals that also comment on the weather. So uh, if we want them to eventually speak to one another in a meaningful way, uh, as we intend to do and build out this portal, uh, it's the job of uh, the team uh, 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 to uh, create a, a data model that would render all these data sets sort of interoperable. Uh, and essentially create this massive data set that I'm promising you all today of historic weather data. Uh, we most certainly have our work cut out for us, uh, but it's sort of an exciting challenge ahead. We have our first planning meeting coming up in November uh, down at UVA. Um, it's exciting. Uh, but as we build a platform like this, uh, I'd say I'm interested and very curious to find what you all would find useful from something like this. Is this resource useful? I think so. I hope so. Um, there's my contact information. I'll take any questions you have whenever, but yeah, so thanks. It's at the end, I'm told. First uh, panel to come up now. So um, if uh, Claire and Louis can come up and uh, we'll take questions.
Good morning, everyone. I am by nature not great with impromptu, um, but climate change is asking us to become better at this. So um, I'm delighted to be able to um, introduce and participate in and be present for this panel on imagined futures. I'm going to first introduce our speakers. We will have each of them present, one in person, one virtually. Um, then I'm going to propose a couple of thoughts and then open it up to questions both in person and remote for anyone who's watching out there in the big world. So I'm delighted to introduce Louis Jardinat, who is a historian of early modern Europe and the Atlantic world. His work combines the history of science with intellectual and environmental history. He's currently writing a monograph that I can't wait to read that examines no pressure, that examines how knowledge about disasters, particularly earthquakes, storms, and epidemics, developed in 17th and 18th century British, Spanish, and French empires as a result of the research practices that scholars adopted in this period. Jardin completed his PhD in history at Harvard in 2021, where he was an affiliate at the Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies. He's been the recipient of a number of fellowships, many of which I could list here, and published in a number of journals as well. He's currently the Haas Postdoctoral Fellow at the Beckman Center for the History of Chemistry and the Science History Institute and an associate of the Department of History at Harvard University. Brady McCartney. Hello, Brady out there, is an interdisciplinary environmental social scientist whose research explores how religious individuals, communities, and institutions are responding to the impacts of anthropogenic climate change. He is currently serving as assistant managing editor for the Journal for the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture while pursuing graduate studies in religion and ecology and environmental history at the University of Florida. Louis, would you like to begin? Thank you very much, Claire, for that introduction. Um, it's an honor to be here today and to be invited to participate in this, this conference. And I'm very grateful to you all for having read my paper. Um, it goes without saying, of course, that this is very much work in progress. So I'm looking forward to receiving your suggestions and your criticisms. And much of the discussion last night at the keynotes um, concerned the question of how best to apply knowledge to addressing the practical realities and the challenges of climate change. I want to start us out today, though, by thinking about how the knowledge of climate change itself came into existence. I'm coming to climate studies from the different, though, related field of historical disaster studies, uh, as you just heard. Um, and that perspective, I think, should be fairly clear from what I've chosen to emphasize in the paper. Although it's historical writing, I've tried to make the paper intelligible to an interdisciplinary audience as well. Um, and I hope that you'll agree with me that part of living with climate change should involve considering past as well as present experiences and engagement with it. As I point out in the paper, there's now a flourishing field of historical scholarship on climate change. And one particularly important part of this concerns the period of global cooling known as the Little Ice Age which took place in the early modern era, uh, which is to say between very roughly the 15th century and the 18th or even early 19th century. And I should note that the exact periodization is still uh, much disputed. Although there are some exceptions, historians have mostly been interested in studying the impacts of climate change in this period. In other words, using climate change to um, understand or to explain major historical developments, whether they're rebellions and revolutions, or the rise and decline of polities, or commercial changes, or changes in navigation, um, many different kinds of, uh, of effects. And this remains very useful and necessary work, and has generated some very important insights into the relationship between environmental and social change. However, as somebody coming to this topic from the vantage point of intellectual history and the history of science, I'm more interested in getting to grips um, with how contemporaries understood these changes. And in this area, there is a great deal more work to be done. Geographically, I'm a historian of Europe and its empires. And some of the key work on the Little Ice Age in Europe has emphasized um, contemporary ignorance rather than knowledge, I think it's fair to say. And the end result is that we're left with the impression that people applied a, a fairly simple religious formula um, concerning divine punishment for sinfulness uh, that obviated any further inquiries. 
Uh, but of course, I knew that there had to be more to it than that, uh, partly because my, that PhD research I did on disaster ideas in this period um, showed that alongside those religious scripts, there was actually a complex intellectual ecology as well. So while it's correct uh, to emphasize the importance of religion, we shouldn't assume that theology contained the era's entire intellectual output on environmental questions. And then, thanks to recent work by Olivia Barnett, uh, we're also starting to see that even that those religious interpretations were capable of generating quite complex ideas about the climate. It's worth noting that the word climate itself did exist in the early modern period, but it tended to have different associations than the ones that we're familiar with today. It's probably better to think of it as referring to um, an environment or ecosystem. We know a good deal about how people use that word, thanks in large part to scholarship in the histories of meteorology and medicine, and indeed we're very fortunate to have some leading scholars in those areas here with us at the APS this week. And that work has shown how early modern people inherited and adapted classical ideas of stable climatic zones, and how they, they used those to explain perceived racial differences, the incidence of disease, global variation in weather patterns, and other things. However, it's not easy to see how change fits into this picture. We know people thought that bodies could experience change as they moved between climatic zones, uh, for instance, becoming more prey to certain diseases, but could those local climates themselves be subject to major transformation? That's less obvious. It occurs to me that there are a few ways in which people perceive change in this system. Firstly, there's the question of how climates came into existence in the first place and how they will end. Uh, which would take us in the direction of those theological debates about the creation, the fall, the biblical deluge, and the apocalypse. Secondly, we have change outside that providential timescale, and this is what I'm more interested in. To help me think about this, I've reached for a geological analogy, simply because that lets me conceive of two kinds of change, uh, sudden and gradual. I'm wary of pushing the analogy too far because the contexts aren't entirely the same, um, but there are some, nevertheless some interesting points of intersection between theories of the earth and theories of the air. I became particularly interested in conceptions of sudden changes to climates, what I've called catastrophism. When I started writing this paper, I actually intended to chart a fairly broad overview, uh, but I came to see that that, that, could, that was a little too ambitious for this, um, these short pa uh, papers. Um, so I thought it would be better to focus instead on one case study. And I remembered that during my disaster research, I'd come across a lecture by Robert Hooke um, that made what seemed to me at the time to be fairly bizarre connections between European epidemics and South American earthquakes. Um, Hooke was a 17th century natural philosopher, uh, and as Patrick explained yesterday, philosophy here refers to study of the natural world. Uh, he was one of the early members of the Royal Society, which was, and still is, an extremely important English scientific association. Uh, founded in 1660. Hooke is probably best known today for his pioneering publication, Micrographia, which provided some of the first images of what creatures and plants look like when seen through a microscope. But he also had an astonishing array of other interests, not least earthquakes. And for him, earthquakes became a key mechanism for environmental change, including, as it turns out, change in the air. In the paper, I've tried to elucidate Hooke's thinking on climate change and show how it evolved over time. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you, where you think I should take this work. Um, what I'd like to do next with this angle of research is to flesh out the context a little further, uh, on the one hand by showing how Hooke was, in a sense, building on medical theories of climate, uh, and on the other to go into a little more detail on what happened to initiatives to study climate change. In other words, although I think Hooke works as a case study, um, I don't want to make it seem that he was the only person interested in these topics. In any case, um, I'll, I'll be very grateful to get your, your thoughts and suggestions. Uh, thanks, Beth. I'm going to invite everyone to turn their attention to the screen. Uh, we'll have a, a video from Brady McCartney, who unfortunately was not able to join us uh, because of Hurricane Ian. So uh, 
but he was able to send us a slideshow with some commentary, uh, after which Claire will, will provide some, some questions and suggestions on how to tie these papers together. So. As an environmental and religious studies scholar, I began this research by asking a few critical questions. First, how are religions in the Americas presently preparing their followers for climate change events? And second, are there particular traditions stressing preparation for these climate change events? I quickly identified the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the LDS Church, sometimes called the Prepper Church, and its members as an institution and community worthy of study. In approximately 1820, Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of the LDS Church, experienced his first revelation, transmitted from the church's Abrahamic God to Smith. That first revelation and many other early revelations are contained within Doctrines and Covenants. In this book of LDS scripture, LDS church members, saints, are compelled by their God to, quote, organize themselves, prepare every needful thing. Whether planning for Jesus Christ's second coming, U.S. federal government invasions and mob violence, nuclear fallout, or climate catastrophe, the LDS Church has built prepping into the very structure of the church. Though the church lacks an official public position on climate change, it supplies saints with guidance on authority structures, food and water reserves, financial resources, community scale power generation, communications platforms, emergency shelters, and spiritual preparation. Thus, the LDS community offers many prepping lessons and warnings for those living in the age of climate change, from teaching the value of proactive preparation in combating collective fear, to the pitfalls of prioritizing disaster preparation when, to some degree, prevention is still possible. The LDS Church leadership plays an active role in guiding the day-to-day -day lives of the Church's membership. In recent decades, preparedness teachings on natural disasters, weather conditions, and climate events have regularly surfaced in Church communiques. In 1995, Elder L. Tom Perry, an LDS Church leader, stated the following. In this speech, Perry invoked the most common preparation refrain used in LDS communications, quote, if ye are prepared, ye shall not fear, from Doctrines and Covenants. He links preparation to a lack of fear, or perhaps the presence of safety from disasters and weather variances. This idea continues to hold currency in the LDS community. In 2004, Elder Dalen H. Oaks, apostle of the LDS Church's first presidency, shared the following. In addition to preparation language, euphemisms for climate change-driven events, i.e., quote, the accelerating pattern of natural disasters, unquote, are explicitly deployed in many LDS messages. The second coming of Jesus Christ and climate disaster events are frequently referenced together, as Oaks has done in this passage. Climate disasters are not viewed as manifestations of the second coming per se, but the second coming can be seen as a driving force behind climate events. 12th LDS President Spencer W. Kimball wrote at length about creating, quote, a positive program of preparation, unquote, within the LDS community. The LDS Church expects saints to individually, collectively, and collaboratively survive natural and unnatural disasters. To do so, multi-level planning has been built into the very structure of the church. The Provident Living Program is possibly the best example of this planning. Providing online and offline support, Provident Living traces its route to the, quote, man-made, unquote, and natural disasters of the Great Depression, while the LDS Church announced its, quote, church security plan, unquote. Provident Living encompasses many other aspects of LDS life. Food storage and production are key elements. The program recommends that saints build a short-term food supply, three months, and a long-term food supply, one year, with an important caveat, quote, focus on foods such as wheat, rice, pasta, oats, beans, and potatoes that can last 30 years or more, unquote. 
In a related section, the church offers instructions on maintaining safe drinking water options, quote, for circumstances in which the water supply may be polluted or disrupted, unquote. While the church's language can be interpreted as a response to temporary crisis situations or the immediate aftermath of a natural disaster, the emphasis on long-term planning from one year up to 30 years suggests far-sighted preparation. The LDS Church's attention to disaster preparation implicitly and explicitly conveys to saints that prepping is not simply a prudent act, but a religious one authorized and promoted by church leaders and doctrine throughout the institution. Preppers are motivated by a broad set of social, political, and environmental concerns. Within the prepper milieu, the LDS community has served as an inspiration to the broader prepper community. The LDS Church's promotion of preparedness teachings, collection and provision of resources, food, water, and shelter, and the development of community disaster planning programs has been studied by preppers concerned with destabilizing societal events, including climate-driven events. LDS preppers have taken preparedness teachings in many directions. The LDS Preparedness Manual is arguably the best illustration of LDS prepping material produced outside of the church. The manual has been published since 1997 and is currently in its eighth edition. This is a representative excerpt from the manual. As you can see, natural, environmental, and climate disasters are thoroughly considered in this passage. The LDS Preparedness Manual is widely accessible as a free PDF and has therefore been accessible to and influenced preppers well beyond the LDS community. These preppers not only discuss the lessons they have learned from the manual on many online forums, but they also continue to circulate it. The LDS Avow website reports that approximately 203,000 digital copies of the manual have been downloaded by the website's users. The manual has been posted on many other prepper websites and no doubt has been downloaded many more times. Through his New Vistas project, fourth-generation saint David Hall has taken LDS prepping in a different direction. Hall is attempting to build an earthly Zion in the form of a, quote, 144-square-mile, 50-community megalopolis composed of, quote, sustainable housing and agriculture, unquote. Hall's mission is to achieve, quote, global environmental balance by building a network of environmentally and socially sustainable villages, unquote, based on Joseph Smith's 1833 plot of the city of Zion. In LDS Outlier, whose Zion project is not officially sanctioned by the LDS Church, Hall has taken a different view of preparation. He believes that saints would do well to prepare God's kingdom for the second coming by building Zions in the here and now prior to Jesus' arrival and using Joseph Smith's plan as a guide. In Hall's plans, there is an acknowledgement that preparing for the second coming is only possible if humans and the earth live long enough to experience it. From Doctrine and Covenants to the New Vistas Project, I have shown how early church revelations materialized into prepping programs, widely referenced manuals, and even the construction of sustainable earthly Zions. While the LDS approach may not be useful in preventing further anthropogenic climate change, it does indicate that the LDS church and its many believers are well prepared for the second coming and or climate disruptions. If the LDS Church articulated an official position on climate change and began to devote its significant resources to addressing the threats and impacts, the LDS community could lead the religious response to climate change within the U.S. Only time will tell if this possibility comes to pass. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you, Brady, for that impromptu uh, presentation that you put together while being stranded in a hurricane. It is certainly poignant to be discussing this right now in my class on Wednesday, which is about environmental history through cartography. We talked about Franklin's map of the Gulf Stream, which I believe is on exhibit right now, um, alongside satellite images of Hurricane Fiona, which just remade the sandstone of Little Prince Edward Island and now Hurricane Ian, 
As my friend Melanie Keechel just said on Twitter, in this lineage of storms, we need something better than remembering and forgetting. So I'm encouraged to see the dynamic intellectual energy of early American and imperial historical work confront the questions of environmental well-being and crisis. Public and even academic, at least in STEM fields, uh, dialogue frames environmental action as forward-looking. The concept of sustainability suggests sustaining something into years to come. Even adaptation implies a forward progression of place or practice. And yet, as these two papers show, there are deep roots of knowledge and practice that should be taken into account. It's kind of a history of the future. Indeed, there are a range of histories in these two papers, from the early modern and enlightenment thought of England to Reddit, without meaning to sound too out of touch with kids these days. This is the first time I've ever read anything from Reddit. So feel like I've learned something. Um, but isn't that why we're humanists? The full range of human experience, an enormously rich and varied library for historians. I just cited Twitter. And isn't this the work of historians, to find threads, patterns, and precedent? In a class I team teach on the Anthropocene, uh, I go back to the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Old Testament for stories of emergent human ego against moments of environmental crisis, which now seem chillingly prescient. This is from the book of Jeremiah. The sea has come up upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves. Her cities are a desolation, a dry land in a wilderness, a land wherein no man dwelleth, neither doth any son of man pass thereby. So the question with these two papers is, where is the thread of living with climate change? I think it is in the force of curiosity of recognition and acknowledgement, the intellectual understanding, and then the changes, if any, we make in response. Now geology is climate change in terms of our language of the Anthropocene, making Louis' subject about the entwining of these paths of curiosity and understanding all the more apt. A few thoughts that bridge the two papers. I am struck by the open-ended, by which I mean unresolved, question of influence. How do we measure the ripples of impact from the Royal Society or internet downloads? Who is the intended audience and how far does the unintended reach extend? Can we know, especially in the case of LDS and the preppers, when we have seen such a range of survivalist motivations and even radicalized positions in contemporary United States, whether climate change and climate concern is registering? Second, the dichotomy between seeing history as a record of the mundane or of the exceptional, the Daily Journal, Madison, Jefferson, my grandfather, uh, or the catastrophic, as per, and I'm quoting Louis' paper here, a dramatic transformation of the atmosphere over the island for months involving thick smoke and rains of ash. This also called to mind for me the 1816 year without a summer, other disaster-related events, my eight-year-old son would ask that I also mention the dinosaurs. Uh, we may have normalized our expectations of data science to encompass both of these kinds of record keeping, but not in memory or narrative, which tends to favor the exceptional from the Saxby Gale to Hurricane Juan. I think this points to the fundamental difficulty of scale of the, non -hu of the human, whether our imagination or capacity for action, against the non-human of the human lifetime against a longer historical arc, of, to mangle a bicycling metaphor, the wheel of cumulative impact against the spoke of any individual intervention. But both papers raise questions of mobilization and engagement on a larger scale. We've seen recently a sanctioned interest and institutional interest in crowdsourcing or citizen science, an enormous collection of 19th century environment, environment Canada observations in a donation to Western University, the mobilization from Parks Canada, sorry, this is your Canadian content for the month up here, um, in terms of measuring the observations of endangered animals and birds. In today's paper, we, papers, we have a scientist imagining the potential for this kind of citizen science and in some sense, in the other paper, members of a congregation seeing themselves as such a collective agent. I do think we need to distinguish between natural disaster, not authored by humans, religious apocalypse, presumably not authored by humans, and anthropogenic corrosion. 
Is preparation for climate change the same as preparation for the second coming? Is responsibility for the one not different than for the other? I find some comfort as a historian living through and parenting through this age in the thought that history may supply inspiration for ways forward. As Louis's, Louis' paper said, there is a diverse world of ideas remaining to be discovered that promises to furnish us with material for new directions in the intellectual history of climate change. There is a wry comfort in knowing that we have known of these conditions for centuries, even if some, most of us, have chosen to ignore them. And as Brady shows, the LDS Church shows that uh, the LDS Church has at least had the capacity for mobilization. Uh, the instruction, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee. Again, this will resonate with anyone who's tried to leave the house with a small child. <laughs> I was struck, though, by the direction of responsibility, an inward and select survivalism, compared, for example, with the Mennonite library of food practices and sharing more with less. I'm living in central PA right now, which seemed to have an emphasis on sharing wisdom and sharing resources. Do these intentional communities show us how to proceed? Why would they be adverse or hesitant to acknowledge climate change if LDS does acknowledge man-made disasters? So I guess my questions to you and to the authors is what would each author say about reaching an audience? And how do we lift our gaze from disaster? Thoughts, questions for in person? <laughs> or remote. I don't know if Louie, if you want to tackle that as we're getting started. Sure, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, it's a lot, sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of reflections, but that's some, some excellent ones. Thank you, Claire. Um, I particularly uh, latched onto your um, you're connecting the, the language of geology with the language of, of the Anthropocene. And of course, that, um, that's a nice sort of overlap with the, uh, the paper that I've written where I'm, I'm, using, I'm reaching for geological analogies. And I, uh, I hadn't actually thought about connecting it to um, Paul Crutzen's uh, Anthropocene, but I think um, there is a clear case for that. So, so that's great. Um, climate history as, as mundane versus exceptional is an interesting um, binary to mm -hmm. apply to it. Um, I wonder whether we can't have both at the same time, um, because, I mean, as we know today, we deal with uh, both the exceptional um, disaster events, hurricanes and droughts and so on, but we're also aware of um, the impact of cumulative change to, to temperatures and other uh, climatic variables. Um, and what I've tried to suggest here, although I've emphasized the, um, uh, sudden, the suddenness of climate mm. um, alterations is that, in tandem with that, there were also ideas about um, change over the longer term. Uh, I think that probably would require more space to, to explore and elaborate. Um, but there is work um, already published on, uh, on slower change over time in, in the meteorological context. Um, uh, so I think we have good models to, to work with there historically, um, and it would be useful, I think, to, to kind of counterbalance the disastrous with the, the slower change. Um, so I'll look forward to exploring that in more detail. Did you want to speak to the... I, I guess I can only say that <clears throat> I hope that our project... Hello? It went out. Hear me? Yeah, good. All right. Um, that our project can contribute to that uh, because I, I feel a lot of this data is not out there and I think that more data might help create more models and Hi, this is Xin Yue from Texas A&M University. Uh, thanks a lot for your wonderful presentation on regarding the historical documents and uh, the thoughts on uh, crime. Uh, so my question is, have you seen any efforts of building ontology among these documents so that we can search them more logically and we also will be able to verify other people's research, replicate other people's work. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the hope. Um, uh, our, project, our project is a, a little different. There's 
There's other projects out there that are already uh, sort of building these data, and we're going to be in conversations with those people starting November. Uh, but that is the goal is to uh, create or extract this data uh, from these resources in a way that they'll be uh, infinitely searchable, building ontologies, stuff like that. So, yes. So the answer is I, I don't know yet. Um, we're still exploring that. Hi, uh, David Valinsky over at the Drexel University Department, the Environmental Science Department. Uh, Bayard, this is a question for your gathering, I guess an early citizen science data gathering for temperature recording around in the early United States. Has anybody looked at the thermometers back then to look at the accuracy of them, to assess them so they can be used for today, you know, to use as, you know, going forward? Yes. <laughs> um, yes, so uh, that's... Uh... Again, part of the project is to uh, look at the instruments that folks were using and then compare them to the instruments that we use to uh, measure the same things today. Um, whenever you're using uh, historic sources or, or especially uh, weather calculations, you have to uh, take that into consideration that the way that they gather temperatures is way different than the way we gather temperatures now. Um, and to make this data usable, I think you just have to uh, accept that there are differences and, and we I think that's part of the, the larger conversation that we're going to have starting November is, is how do we um, sort of you know uh, figure out a way to uh, you know make sense of that I suppose uh, you know they're using temperatures because I think out of our one of our earlier conversations you know uh, some thermometers that were used in some of these weather records only went down to a a certain uh, temperature, but if it goes way below freezing, then they, they just have to make an average, like, okay, this is below freezing, so the temperature's not actually there. So then, as the instruments go further on, they go down. So. Thank you for the presentations. I would like to state a question for Brady that if he ever watches the proceedings, maybe, is that okay? Um, just a question about um, the LDS Church's pronatalist policies that they want to increase population constantly, constantly. And so I just wonder how that fits in <laughs> with um, a sense of physical preparation for the end of the world if you're trying to maximize world population. Um, I'm sure he has an answer for this, but it would be interesting to know. I had a question about the, the climate, the, the, the database. Um, about whose knowledge is being represented. Um, and it's, it can be boiled down to, did James Madison do all of his own observations or was he gathering from other people? As other, especially um, enslavers, uh, sometimes did on larger estates, that they are really representing the knowledge of unnamed people. So I wondered about that as a phenomenon and how this data is going to be explained as belonging uh, to certain people, uh, whether in the past or now. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a, a great question. And we, and we know that, that Madison, you go through any of these records and you see uh, several different hands uh, all throughout the books. Um, so we don't know whose hands they're in all the time. Um, this is something we do with our, our other open data projects is we just create general statements that you know this data is extracted from uh, certain people, and uh, we don't always know. Um, I keep saying this, I'm punting this to November, but this is part of the conversation that you'll be a part of in November. Um, so we can raise this question yeah. then as well. Um, but, we, but we are definitely thinking about that and, and, and how to, to deal with that and how to, uh, uh, you know, figure out how to give credit to the people who are creating this data and, and sort of think about you know, uh, what sort of the conditions were they creating this data under? So, to be continued. I have a question for Lewis. Um, I, I know that uh, your work is looking at how um, events are depicted and interpreted. Um, in, in some ways, it's, uh, it's the, uh, the idea of catastrophe, um, maybe more than the catastrophe of itself. But I want to ask you a question similar to the one that Bayard got asked a couple ago, which is, what sources do you use, um, and how can you reconstruct these events uh, as um, uh, accurately as they actually occurred? I mean, I can imagine that there's 
a lot of uh, in printed materials, you know, um, uh, hearsay, uh, rumor, uh, embellishment for the purposes of uh, a whole range of reasons. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about, about you know, your sources and how you've tried to reconstruct events and how that sometimes plays into how they're uh, perceived more generally in the public? That's a really interesting question, Patrick. Um, and it's something I, I, I tackled more when I was um, doing more specifically disaster-oriented research, but um, it'll come up again, I'm sure. Um, I think one of the, the most fascinating aspects of this is that the researchers themselves in the 17th or 18th centuries were interested in precisely that question. How do we know what really happened? Um, and can we really believe the, the accounts that we've been given? Um, and you find lots and lots of... Um, uh, of recorded comments from people saying, I don't actually believe that um, this account is really true, especially uh, if the account is mentioning things like visions of angels or um, strange apparitions and um, prodigious events occurring that, uh, you know, could, could uh, stretch credibility in some cases. Um, and so people uh, did start to develop... Um, systems for vetting information, um, standards of evidence. Uh, they um, sometimes compare different accounts, try and figure out um, what, you know, where the facts are beneath the, beneath the reporting. Um, sometimes you see accounts that have been signed by many people um, to try and validate the, the information contained. Um, at other times, uh, there's an emphasis on statistical information as well. So um, there are, there's kind of a, a repertoire of techniques for ensuring the accuracy of information that get developed uh, at the same time as the ideas themselves are, are emerging. So it's kind of a, I, I think very much um, a, a joint process of um, the, the tools and practices of information collection and organization accompanying the intellectual change, the, the, the change in ideas itself. And uh, hello, uh, my name's Ian CV from uh, Texas A&M, and I had a question for uh, Louis. But uh, fantastic presentations all all the way around. Um, as as you are a historian of um, the European empires, I was wondering um, if you if you elucidate this in your dissertation more in the book manuscript, um, or if this is a new avenue for. For research, but how do you un or how did the empires that you study like understand and and come and like reckon with the idea of how climate and how disasters are impacting the people at the margins of their empires, um, and 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 in the ways in which they are responsible for those people at the margins of their empires. Thank you. A fantastic question. Um, and a difficult one to answer in some ways because um, the evidence is always much thinner when it comes to talking about groups on the margins. And we have to acknowledge also that the empires often didn't really give much thought to those people or they did, it wasn't a primary concern for them. Um, uh, I think you see, uh, sadly, this becomes much more visible in the sources when those groups posed a problem or a threat, or a perceived threat to the, the control of, uh, of, of imperial authority. Um, uh, to give one example, when uh, either disasters or um, climatic events like droughts and, and, um, and water shortages and so on um, uh, drove indigenous groups uh, to um, you know, desperate, desperate measures to try and recover um, either dispossessed land or um, resources, then you start to see reporting um, from the colonial authorities uh, saying that we've got, we've got problems. And um, so they, I think there was, there definitely was reflection on the, uh, I guess you could say, indirect societal consequences of these kinds of um, climatic events and disasters. Um, but, but in that kind of order context of uh, the stability of, of colonial rule, for sure. Okay, um, I, have a, I have a question for Louis. Um, the paper was great. I thought it was, you made a really good case for Hook. And I had more questions about Hook um, specifically. And it's sort of like a twofold question. One is, um, 
did Hook have sort of like other lectures or other kinds of evidence that you found of this kind of notion of uh, climate change or was this sort of like a one-off? And um, the, the second question is you sort of touched upon it uh, in the paper and in your opening remarks today, oops, um, but that I, I was curious about how other people have interpreted these lectures. I mean, you found it odd initially, but is it is it sort of like he kind of had this and moved on or um, that sort of I want to know uh, what, what you found so far about and Hook and his interpretation. Thanks, Miriam. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, this is what I've found so far from Hook. Uh, there might be other material that I haven't yet encountered. Um, obviously, I'll keep, I'll keep searching for it. Um, but it's, I think you kind of had to put this, the kind of um, the sporadic attention to these issues in the context of what Hook was doing, which was basically looking at a massive range of, of different um, topics and experiments and, and issues more or less at the same time. So he always had a huge amount of stuff going on. Um, and he was also uh, in a slightly odd position at the Royal Society in that he was um, a sort of employee, really. Uh, he's sometimes considered to be the first paid research scientist, I think. Uh, I don't really know if that's, you know, it's, it's slightly anachronistic, I think. But um, he was paid by the Royal Society. He wasn't so he wasn't always seen in, on a position of equality with the rest of the, the members. I think that changed somewhat over the course of time, but um, particularly early on when we're looking at the 1663 contribution, he was like taking directions. I, I think I've mentioned in the paper that he was directed to look at certain, certain sources, and that's basically, he was ordered to. That was his, his bosses were telling him, this is what you've got to do. So he, um, he wasn't entirely a free uh, actor and in that sense, he did have to do certain things. Um, and his attention was always in many different directions at once. And the other thing that I wanted to kind of point out in the paper is that a lot of this, um, this thinking about climate is connected to his other interests in uh, fossils and in earthquakes as a mechanism of, of um, planetary change. So to the degree at, uh, to which those, um, those things to, to which climate uh, is related to those things, I think he became more and more interested. And then you get this 1688 lecture, and I'm not entirely sure why he started thinking about this, but um, it, it does seem to be a little bit out of left field in a way. It, it, it certainly relates to his earthquake um, research, so it's possible that he had just assembled a, a bunch of information and thought, oh, this is, this is unusual, maybe I can make sense of it this way. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, um, it's hard to say. I'm certainly going to explore that more. Um, in terms of the way people interpreted the lectures, um, I don't know if you were thinking of at the time or subsequently by, by historians. Um, in, in, in more recent times, historians have tended to focus on Hooke's um, um, fossil um, theories. So you, you get historians of geology looking at um, whether he was sort of one of the, the first people to, uh, to acknowledge that fossils were um, once living creatures and not, they're called games of nature, um, not sort of uh, uh, strange productions like um, self-producing shapes of animals and rock or something like that. So um, that's, I think, really got most of the attention of historians and I haven't really looked, there has been some attention on his um, interest in the weather, but not so much on uh, the, this, these kind of climatic questions of how the different variables interact. Um, so I think this is, a, this is a new avenue of research as far as I'm aware. There's a question in the back. Hi, <clears throat> sorry. Um, my name is Brendan Gillis. I'm uh, at Lamar University. Uh, and I have a question about uh, epistemology. Um, so last night, one of the themes, one of the takeaways from the keynote for me was um, an awareness that we need to think about how to connect uh, wide-scale policy, uh, sweeping global change, um, and local communities to, to anchor um, big stories of climate change um, and the response to climate change in, in small stories. Um, and I think one of the themes of several of the papers is that uh, the narratives that we have for capitalism um, don't always do a very good job 
of making that connection or allowing for that connection to take place. Um, and so hearing all of these presentations, reading across these papers, um, I wonder um, to what extent we might want to think about religion and religious narratives as an alternative, um, or it, whether that just puts us down an esch eschatological rabbit hole. You know, um, religion seems very good at uh, contemplating uh, catastrophe and apocalypse. Um, uh, so, you know, whether whether we should be thinking of new ways of framing um, this uh, these questions uh, to apply them in different ways. Um, and alongside that, uh, one of the other alternatives that I've heard raised in, in papers and out, uh, elsewhere is this idea of the radical decentralization that's allowed through digital tools. Um, so is digitization, um, is, do digital tools allow us to create another um, way of framing our collective response to climate change? So easy question. Sounds like a question for you, Brady. That... Uh, I can answer the last part and just say I think yes the digital tools will allow us to do that um, I think it yeah I, I, I think for what we're doing it's, it's freeing this stuff up uh, decentralizing it from books I guess so yeah I will say yes but the first part I I can't speak to religion well I can speak to religion in the historical sense so is that what you did you have that sort of in mind, or were you thinking more about uh, today's? Is this perhaps a question for Brady with the LDS Church? I was trying to advocate the both of these because I think it has historical dimensions, but it's good at it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that with uh, 17th century religion then. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I would call it a different epistemology, particularly if you're thinking about capitalism as a sort of an alternative point of view, I think it would be, it would be hard to, to position that for the, for the early modern period. Um, there are debates about whether or not we can, we can talk about capitalism before uh, the sort of industrialization of the 18th century. Um, um, I won't get into that now, but uh, I, it, it's definitely possible to see um, religious uh, motivations connecting dis otherwise disparate phenomena. So um, I, I have seen a lot of um, evidence of um, religious speculation connecting events, cat catastrophic events, for instance, in one country to another. Um, I, I wrote a paper on um, uh, how the Jamaican earthquake of 1692 was connected to events in, in England. And one could say... Um, Hook's connection of the South American earthquake to, to English epidemics is sort of running along similar lines, even though it's not religious in itself. Um, so there is a kind of a, a propensity to connect dots, if you like, um, in order to reach some kind of uh, synthetic conclusion. Um, so yeah, I suppose you could, you could argue that epistemically um, there, is, um, there is something there that, uh, that could be drawn on. Um, but again, I'm not sure that we could say that's specifically a religious um, function um, because you know, we do see that kind of ability in other streams of thought as well. Um, and perhaps it's just important to note that um, we can't entirely single out these different strands of, of thinking. They're, they're kind of, at least in the period that I look at, um, very much interrelated and, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the, the researchers working for the Royal Society, for instance, are many of them quite religious as well. Um, so, yeah, I think we see a kind of fusion of those, those discourses too. If I could jump in, thank you very much for your question because I think you, you were able to give language to something that I've, I've been wrestling with in this whole practice. Um, there is a fascination with, but also kind of the, the risk of fetishization of this burgeoning climate knowledge, especially in the early modern era. Isn't this amazing how they can record um, this cumulative data? And then today, um, we see this fetishization in the stories of community response, people coming together, all that kind of thing. Um, and the narratives are both in, in the academic and the public sphere still very much 
undergirded by a narrative of progress and a narrative of human heroism. And you, you talked about the narratives of capitalism. I think that's probably a driving force here. We don't have narratives of culpability um, in the same way. And I, I feel like that's an absence. And I, I don't know how to sort of reconcile the sources we do have, because um, it's obviously not something that really comes to the fore to the record makers. Um, but thank you for your question, because I think that's something that we're grappling with here. So I think we have time for one more question, and there's one online. Oh, perfect. So I'll turn it over to uh, Nathan. Yeah, a question from one of our online viewers is for Louis. Uh, was wondering if you have delved into also into any similarities between Hooke's arguments and how current climate scientists talk about and frame questions of teleconnections, i.e. climate variability links between non-contiguous geographic regions. That's an amazing question. Um, I can't say that I've, um, I've connected it specifically to modern climate science, um, but I am thinking about teleconnections um, between, uh, I mean, these, these, these phenomena in different countries. Uh, so for sure, I'm, I'm very interested in, in how people were connecting um, uh, events in Peru to events in Europe or um, to North America, to Asia and so on. Um, so I, I think there are fascinating aspects of that story that remain to be told. Um, I do tackle that in my disaster research as well, but I think there is, um, important space for that in history and in intellectual history of climate change too. Well, I think that's our cue. Thank you all for your attention and your questions. Thank you to our panelists, including our impromptu panelist. <laughs> Thank you to Claire for moderating.